Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, today, our speaker is Tim Schultz. Um, Tim um, has spent a year here in Australia under uh, with a fellowship offered by the Humboldt Foundation in uh, Germany. So I'm a former Humboldt Fellow, and that allows us to um, host visits um, by um, uh, upcoming German young researchers. So if you know any people that fit that category, you know, if there is a possibility of luring them out here um, support from one of these schemes. So both um, Armin Abelay and um, Torsten Trupka came out under that scheme originally. So Tim's been out here a year working at the University of Sydney on upconversion. Um, so Tim was originally um, educated in Switzerland and Germany, I believe, and um, has spent a year at Sydney University working on uh, the upconversion project there, which we're going to hear more about now. <coughs> Thanks a lot, Martin, for the introduction. Um, so I'd like to introduce the title of my talk, which is Improving the Light Harvesting of Thin Film Solar Cells with Photochemical Upconversion. So um, upconversion, of course, is about harvesting sub-band gap photons. So we're trying to, to bridge that gap, somehow make use of all these photons with energies less than the absorber band gap. and um, now, there's two principal strategies that uh, could be taken towards this goal. So the first one is um, by the so-called intermediate band solar cell, where you essentially try to um, engineer the electronic structure of the photovoltaic absorber as to introduce a, um, well, a band in the middle of the band gap, essentially, and thus, all right, um, and thus make use of, uh, of sub band gap photons. The problem with this concept uh, is that it essentially requires a complete re-engineering of, of the solar cell. Um, the second lane is photonic upconversion. Here the idea is to um, have a spectral conversion unit which can just be an add-on to existing solar cell technology. Um, now the, the advantage of this would be that existing uh, solar cells can be uh, extended in their harvesting by just applying such upconverting unit. Um, so I would say from the engineering point of view, that's intrinsically more interesting than the intermediate band solar cell. Um, also, within uh, the field of photonic upconversion, there's different lanes. Of course, you know about coherent processes, uh, two-photon absorption happening in, in uh, nonlinear optical media, <coughs> which can give rise to coherent upconverting effects. This is uh, exploited, for example, in <coughs> ultra-fast uh, spectroscopy, laser spectroscopy with um, parament parametric amplifiers. Um, but for solar energy conversion, this is not too interesting uh, due to the extremely high photon fluxes which are required uh, to achieve this and also the, um, the coherent nature of the light. Um, so we are interested in incoherent upconversion and also within this field there's two lanes. Um, first of all, what I would term here energy transfer upconversion, um, which is exploiting um, the levels, the energy levels of lanthanide ions in a solid state matrix. Um, this is what, what is uh, explored here in, in Gavin Conneby's group, um, as you know. And the field that we are working in is called photochemical upconversion. Now, this is based on triplet triplet annihilation in organic molecules. I'm going to introduce this concept in more detail a bit later. So this is a non-coherent um, upconversion process. Currently, it's working in the, in the red and maybe near infrared. So we cannot extend um, as far down into the infrared as with the lanthanides. Um, but as I will show you within this talk, um, for the same types of solar cell, we can get uh, figures of merit or current enhancements uh, better by about three orders of magnitude as compared to the lanthanide-based upconversion systems applied to the same cells. Now the structure of the talk um, is the following. <coughs> I'm going to quickly show you which efficiency gains we could expect from upconversion in the optimum case. Um, I'm going to explain what triplet-triplet annihilation actually is, uh, which role the spin physics um, play in this process, uh, and also how or how not they limit the efficiency. Um, I'm going to explain how we can describe this process by rate equations. I'm going to show you the state of the art which we have reached at Sydney Uni with applying these TTA-based upconverters to solar cells, um, and also yeah, talk about how to improve on these reached current uh, improvements um, before I conclude. Now, 
Um, you all might know plots of these kinds where we see uh, the importance, relative importance of um, loss mechanisms um, depending on the band gap of a single junction or single threshold photovoltaic absorber material. And um, yeah, quite intuitively, uh, it's clear that for high uh, values of the band gap, the, the below band gap losses or the tr transmission of photons with energy uh, less than the band gap is dominating um, the, the losses. So in this region around, well, say 1.7 EV, um, many of, of current uh, thin film uh, solar cell approaches are found, amorphous silicon, OPV, dye cells, also the, the novel meso superstructured solar cells uh, proposed a few weeks ago are found in this region. So here uh, we clearly lose uh, the, the largest part uh, of photons which cannot be harvested by transmission. Um, so here upconversion could help. So essentially we want to take two low energy photons and merge them into one higher energy photon which can be harvested. Um, people have looked at, at this from um, a conceptual point of view. Um, you can also invoke detailed balance to calculate which efficiency gains would be expected here. Uh, also quite intuitively the larger band gaps uh, lead to the higher improvements by upconversion. Interestingly, the optimum band gap is shifted from the 1.3 EV that you know from the shockley quiser limit to about 1.7 EV, which makes these uh, large band gap thin film solar cell concepts suddenly within the, the range of uh, optimum efficiency in the presence of an upconverter. And we can reach, well, slightly less than 45% conversion efficiency in the very best case. Um, yeah is shown here. Okay, triplet-triplet annihilation, uh, the process that we are pursuing, um, is essentially a, a process happening in a bimolecular um, organic system. So we start off with a sensitizer molecule, which can absorb a low-energy photon, promoting it from its ground state singlet to its, its first excited singlet state. And the, the nature, one property of this molecule is that it has a very fast intersystem crossing to a triplet state. Um, which lies, well, as, as uh, low as to prevent uh, a re-excitation uh, to the singlet state, but this is usually fulfilled for, for most um, organic chromophores that undergo intersystem crossing. Um, now, a triplet state cannot be quenched by fluorescence because now we have the ground state electron and the excited electrons in the same spin state, so Pauli's principle prevents this process, and this makes this um, state a long-lived state, and this is important um, for the efficiency of this overall process. Now, we have a second class of molecules which we call the emitter, um, which also has a, a triplet state in, well, a, a comparable energy range as the sensitizer. And for example, by bimolecular collision, but not necessarily limited to that mechanism, we can transfer uh, this triplet energy stored in the sensitizer to the emitter and thus prepare it to be in its first excited triplet as well. And if we have two excited triplets um, prepared by this process coming together, eventually, and I will go into the details of when this happens, um, one of them is quenched to the, to the ground state while the other one is promoted to its first excited singlet state and then can undergo fast fluorescence at a higher photon energy than the one initially, initially absorbed. And you see here that there's a number of downhill <coughs> processes here involved um, to drive this process, so we are losing part of the energy on this way. Um, so this fluorescent energy that we get out in the end will less than twice the energy of the photons initially absorbed. Um, in this case, it's quite obvious we are absorbing red light and making yellow light, but I'll show you another picture where we can actually make blue light out of red light. So uh, the margins that we can get for this upconversion process are, can be as large as one EV, approximately. Um, so the concept of application is pretty straightforward. We can take a thin film solar cell um, and just use this transmitted light by um, putting an upconverting medium behind it. Um, a, a back reflector would be a, a, a suited component of, of such upconverting unit as well um, to help multi-passing the incoming light and also to help uh, with the outcoupling of the upconverted light and then we re-radiate it back towards the solar cell and harvest these photons. 
here you see another example of this system. So usually, um, up to now, we are working in the liquid phase. We have both of these uh, molecules dissolved in an organic solvent in a glass cuvette under vacuum to uh, avoid oxygen um, quenching uh, the triplets because oxygen also has a, uh, a triplet state and, and uh, acts as a pretty efficient quencher in this mechanism. So keeping oxygen out is at the moment uh, an important ingredient of having a, an efficient TTA up converter. Um, now let me go briefly into the details of the spin physics um, because quite a for quite a long time it was thought that there would be a fundamental limit to the efficiency of TTA up conversion resulting from the spins. So what we have um, when two excited emitter molecules in their first triplet states come together um, is, is some, some kind of compound which we need not to define in detail where we then have four uh, spins, um, two spins in the, in the first excited states and two spins in the ground state and we can in principle uh, combine these four spins to form singlet, um, triplet or quintet uh, ensembles. And um, only the singlet would give rise to fluorescence. So for a long time it was thought that this would limit mm, the efficiency fundamentally. So um, if you look at this picture you could think, okay, if we combine this and this spin into a singlet and this and this, um, we see that we can form one uh, singlet ground state and one excited singlet uh, going down into the ground state by fluorescence and we get the photon out. <coughs> Um, in another case, we can combine them to form a triplet. Um, if there is a triplet level accessible here, usually they are high in energy, at least in the chromophores we would like to look at, um, this would normally lead to uh, internal com conversion. Um, and we end up with one excited triplet coming out of this collision, but no flu upconverted fluorescence. And um, in principle, we could also reach quintet states. Um, and when you look at the multiplicities, you see that from a simple spin statistical picture, you would expect uh, one out of nine collisions leading to a singlet, three out of nines leading to triplets, and five out of nines leading to quintet states. And that led some people to assume that only 11% conversion efficiency of this um, triplet encounter or 5.5% quantum yield um, would be the limit. However, uh, it was found that the quintet states cannot be populated because the according level is just too high in energy. So this would require some considerable uphill and just doesn't happen. And well, the same is, is almost true for the triplet. So also uh, this, this uh, second excited triplet level is lying so high in energy that it's only barely, uh, barely reachable. And the rates uh, of triplet formation are severely affected by that. So what we can measure uh, uh, in our experiment is a conversion efficiency of 60% or a quantum yield of 30% taking into account that 50% quantum yield would be the maximum for an up conversion process of course. So this is quite quite promising and well not, not very intuitive but it, it turns out to be true for the systems that we are looking at. Um, so that's good for the application of course. Um, so keeping um, keeping the focus on the efficiency of this process, um, there are other loss mechanisms which needs to be considered. Um, and the rates or, or the ratio of the rates that we have for these losses will in the end determine uh, the efficiency that we can reach. Um, one important ingredient here is the generation rate or the rate of excitation of the sensitizer. This of course depends on the illumination density. Um, then this intersystem crossing and also this triplet energy transfer here usually happens fast and it's not limiting the process. What we indeed have, however, is a, a non-radiative quenching mechanism of the emitter with a certain rate. And then, of course, the triplet-triplet annihilation rate. And uh, now putting together these rates in, uh, in a rate equation describing the triplet um, state number density of the emitter molecules, we can um, look at the, for example, the dependence on illumination level of our you know, upconversion process. And these rates can also be measured. Um, the guys at Sydney Uni have spent the last years um, in, in the ultra-fast uh, laser lab on, on doing this, and we are now quite sure um, about what we look at there. And um, 
So what we find is that there's two distinct regimes of operation of this TTA process. We have uh, what we call an inefficient regime, where we have a quadratic dependence of the upconverted yield on the illumination density. Um, and this is due to the fact that by increasing the, the uh, illumination density or excitation rate, K phi, um, we increase both the efficiency and the total number of photons involved in the process. So that's why it's quadratic. But once uh, we hit this uh, ceiling of 30% of quantum yield or 60% efficiency, um, it rolls over to be linear because the, um, the efficiency is not longer going up with the excitation rate. Um, and this, this dependence was confirmed by a number of different groups around the world looking at TTA up conversion. Um, so this is quite useful if you want to know where, where your system is working at, at, at which efficiency you can look at the, at the slope of the dependence on, on K phi. Um, so the bad news is that experimentally under one sun condition, uh, we are about here at the moment, so we can realize excitation rates between 1 and 10 uh, per second and per molecule behind a solar cell. And that means that there's still quite a long way to go uh, until we hit this 30% quantum yield limit. And um, I'm going to go back to the slide um, later on uh, when I discuss the, the different routes that could lead to in improving the upconversion yield. Um, one important equation is this one. So if we assume to be in the inefficient regime, uh, rate equation for, for TTA is much smaller than K1, um, then we can solve easily for the triplet concentration, which is directly related to the yield. And we see that there's three quantities. So K1 um, is the non-radiative uh, non quenching rate. This is not easily engineered because it's a property of the molecules that we're using. Um, however, the, the other two quantities we can uh, tackle. So K phi um, can be tuned when we concentrate the light. So obviously, we, we don't want to put uh, a thin film solar cell under concentration. However, there's, of course, optical means within the upconverting unit where we can locally have a higher K phi. Um, so a very simple means is just having a back reflector at an appropriate distance. Um, we can use microfocusing. We could think <coughs> about near field focusing effects such as uh, plasmonics. Um, and the second quantity is the, um, the number density um, within a given volume of the sensitizer molecules. And um, we are limited there at the moment if we are in the liquid phase due to the solubility of these organic compounds. But um, going to the solid state by some uh, strategy, uh, we'll go into details later, um, might help to increase this uh, concentration by uh, a large factor. And this, will, this is probably the most promising route, as you will see. All right, so let's get to the, to the experiments. Um, so our choice of solar cells um, was uh, the following. We, we started off with bifacial semi-transparent amorphous silicon solar cells processed in, in Berlin at HZB or the, the photovoltaic competence center, which is it's affiliated to, to HZB. Um, yeah, it looks like this typical reddish color of an amorphous silicon solar cell. These are two of the, the lab guys, Dennis Cheng, who did most of the photophysics work, and Burkhard Fuckel, who also was a Humboldt fellow and <coughs> left earlier this year. Um, and if you look at the, the spectra, it's also kind of typical for a morphous silicon, a smeared out EQE. We don't have a, a very clear cutoff because the, the, the threshold in a morphous silicon is not, not very well defined. Um, in this case, or with this design, we could reach transmission values of about 50%. Uh, in the red and, and infrared region. Now, the, the goal is, of course, to find um, suited materials for this solar cell. Um, we used PQ4 PDNA, which is a palladium porphyrin uh, synthesized particularly for this purpose at, at Sydney Uni by Maxwell Crosley's group, and a pretty standard emitter, um, which is rubrine, and the solvent was toluene. And, um, if you look at the spectra, you can already uh, guess that this combination is, is well suited for the solar cell. We have the absorption of the porphyrin, which is our sensitizer, um, coinciding with the, the plateauing of the transmission, so where the solar cell transmits most of the, of the photons, while the emission of rubrine is there where the EQE is also merging into a plateau, so where the solar cell can make uh, best use of, of the photons, which are upconverted. Um, 
optical configuration is pretty straightforward. We had to operate the, the solar cell the wrong way around because we needed the glass substrate to optically couple the upconverter um, to it. The upconverter is still contained in a, in a cuvette, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we were playing around with the optics a bit. Um, we found that it's very um, beneficial to have uh, silver-coated glass beads of about 100 micron diameter um, in the up conversion cuvette. And this is, uh, as, as mentioned before, helping um, to <coughs> outcouple the upconverted light. So we have did some optical modeling. And depending on the nature of, of a back reflector, you see that as compared to the infinite limit, um, you would expect a gain of between 2.5 and 3.5 as a factor um, for the upconversion yield um, by having a back reflector at an appropriate distance. And this distance coincides roughly to the inverse absorption coefficient of, of uh, the solution. And this is, well, could, could be intuitively understood um, because then you have 1 over E of uh, the incident photons uh, being absorbed in the first pass and some fraction is, is, um, is bounced back towards the solution from the back reflector. Um, so we employed this as a standard method now for the uh, EQE measurements. And then, yes, this leads to uh, an improvement of about a factor of two, so less than predicted by the optical modeling, but we don't had any optical losses in this model. Okay, so what we do is measuring uh, EQE of the solar cell with and without up conversion. A convenient way of, of uh, showing or presenting these data is to take the ratio of EQE curves with and without up conversion. Um, you see here that we have an improvement of, well, about 3% as a peak value in the EQE around 700 nanometers. Um, the black line that you see is a model, um, oh yeah, in the experimental conditions. Um, we were pumping the upconverter at, at 19 suns equivalent um, with red light. This is important because, <coughs> as mentioned earlier, the response on illumination density is quadratic of our upconversion unit, and the faint illumination that you usually have in a, in a chopped EQE measurement is, is not enough to get a response from a quadratic um, responding material. So we need to, to have a CW uh, pumping component to get a, a background triplet concentration to see this um, AC signal from up conversion in the EQE measurement, but yeah, that's an experimental detail, but we have to uh, keep in mind that this is effectively under 19 suns. And uh, yeah, the delta JSC is about 0.3 milliamps per square centimeter in this case. The black line is a, is a model, so we were looking at the, at the expected um, form of this curve in the case of a uh, CW pumped EQE measurement. I don't want to go into the details, so there's a number of quantities going in here, the transmission of the solar cell, of course, the optical properties, the absorption uh, cross-section of the sensitizer. And then we have a single parameter, which is fitted, and this is the, the overall efficiency of the uh, upconversion system, which is uh, incorporating the, the intrinsic efficiency, but also the optical coupling to the solar cell. And fitting this one parameter, we get a very nice fit to these data. So, yeah, we, we understand what's going on there. Um, so these are recent data on amorphous silicon cells. If you compare these to uh, the very first results that we've published earlier this year, uh, about eight months ago, you see that there's quite uh, an improvement in terms of signal to noise and also in, in terms of um, relative efficiency increase at a given concentration. So these measurements were employing different sensitizer molecules and comparing them. Um, what's also straightforward is um, to transfer this concept to other types of, of thin film solar cells. We've been looking at, at OPV cells um, that came from Karlsruhe in this case, group of, of uh, Alexander Koltzmann at KIT. Um, so these were two different cells employing, well, I'd say pretty common combination of, of, uh, of organic blends, P3HT, ICBA, and PCDTBT, PCBM. Um, in these cases, we could combine the upconverter um, to both sides of the cell because these cells were encapsulated with glass. So that allowed our optical coupling scheme um, for both sides. Well, I don't want to go into details. We found some, some dependence uh, of the upconversion signal on um, the illumination direction, essentially, which uh, we attributed to this uh, silver layer, which, oh, sorry, um, which <coughs> we had 
which we had in here and which um, yeah, gives rise to additional optical losses. And it, it's detrimental if you have this between your upconverter and the solar cell, which is kind of intuitive. But, um, so this leads to uh, the lagging behind of these blue data points here. Um, all right, and we've also applied it to dye-sensitized solar cells, but it essentially looks the same. So I'm going to show you these data. So it's, it's straightforward um, to apply it. Now the question is, of course, um, w what is the actual improvement that we can have and, and how can we compare this to other uh, strategies uh, for upconversion? Okay, and another thing, if you don't like these plots, uh, where we show the ratio of EQE, um, of course that's not a very um, good way of comparing different um, uh, cells because it depends then on, on the level of EQE that you have in the given wavelength range. You can also see it if you just plot the EQEs uh, in one graph, but you don't see the specific uh, absorption features of the porphyrins anymore. So I think it's, it's still worthwhile showing, showing these slides. Um, now, how to compare these, these different results? We've proposed a figure of merit, which is the current <coughs> enhancement that we could expect at one sun. So essentially, we have to get rid of these um, uh, distortions introduced by having a light bias on the up converter. And uh, we do this by calculating the uh, improvement in the current and dividing that by the square of the solar concentration that was effectively employed here. Now, there's one paper out where uh, people um, from Utrecht have applied lanthanide upconversion to more silicon cells. Now, to the lanthanide people, I have to say I don't know if that's a fair comparison in this case because I, I really can't judge if that was a competitive system that these guys were looking at. But this is the only published uh, data, to my knowledge, for uh, lanthanides and amorphous silicon. And uh, so, comparing to, to these results that reached about well, 10 to the minus 6 milliamps per square centimeter at one sun. Um, even the very first results had about two orders of magnitude improvement. And uh, then the next step was looking at the optics, uh, introducing these glass beads that I showed you to help uh, outcoupling of the upconverted light. Mm -hmm. And finally, we also optimized the, the combination of upconversion materials and solar cells, um, reaching a point close to 10 to the minus 3 milliamps per square centimeter. So that's about three orders of magnitude better than lanthanides behind amorphous si silicon solar cells. But on the other hand, it's also still quite a long way to go um, to reach what I would call device-relevant uh, current improvements. So I would say if we could hit um, several tenths of milliamps, maybe one milliamp, we maybe would be in the game and, and be able to compete with other light chirping um, schemes for thin film solar cells. So that's about well, a bit more than two orders of magnitude still to go. So how can we do that? Um, we've been uh, simulating the, uh, the optics, combining the rate equations with, um, with the presence of a back reflector and so on. So we found that um, even assuming optimized coupling between the solar cell and the up converter and a back reflector at exactly the right uh, position, we couldn't get much higher than, than the values that we've reached so far. However, if we increase the sensitizer concentration by a factor of 100, uh, we can almost um, directly convert this, this factor of 100 into efficiency improvement. So we would be close to 10 to the minus 1 then. And if we assume at the present, uh, with the present materials that we have at hand, um, an upconversion process at the, at the full efficiency of 30% quantum yield, we would already be in this range uh, at about 0.4 milliamps. So that shows you that Although this is, uh, well, not, not a realistic case, but the, the materials that we have at hand in terms of absorption range and how, how um, the interplay between emitter and sensitizer molecules um, is functioning are already able to reach this, um, this range once we uh, yeah, manage to increase the, the sensitizer concentration to the um, required uh, factor of 100 or more. Um, there's one other aspect uh, that I want to show you now. So going back to the slide in this equation, we saw that we can bring up the efficiency by either concentrating the light or concentrating the sensitizer. Um, I want to briefly go into these aspects before I come to this. Um, so concentration of light. Um, we've been looking at experimentally. Um, you see again this, this very simple scheme with a back reflector. 
So it would be nice to confirm these optical simulations that I did by varying the distance of the back reflector and thus the, the thickness of the upconverting medium behind the solar cell in situ. So I've built a little setup for this and um, the experimental data looks well, quite all right, I'd say. So combining these, um, these data, which is the, the thickness dependence um, of the upconversion signal <coughs> in the EQE, um, normalized to the infinite limit, so a thickness of several millimeters, you see that you indeed get this, this peak, which is predicted. You don't realize the, the full um, height of, of this peak due to probably optical losses um, in the coupling of these two units, which are not incorporated in the model. But um, the general form of the curve fits nicely. Um, now there's one more thing we can do here, and this is um, the, the mentioned local concentration um, that I talked about before. So due to the nonlinear nature of the upconversion process that we have at the moment, we can gain efficiency by just um, focusing our uh, photons <coughs> in within the upconverting unit. And we, we just explored a very simple means for that, and this is a structured back reflector. So I've taken a, a Teflon foil and embossed um, silica beads into mm, this Teflon material uh, with a hot embossing process um, and coated it with aluminum afterwards. And you see in the SEM image that you get a reasonable, um, well, reasonably well controlled structure of spherical dimples uh, in a reflective material. Uh, doing again ray tracing, you see that you also get some kind of focusing here. Of course, that's not a parabolic mirror, so it's not a perfect focus. It's a bit smeared out, but you could expect some, some focusing result from the spec reflector. Also, the, the fill factor of this dimple is as far from, from perfect, but we didn't want to um, take the step into a lithography process for, for manufacturing this. So this is really just a proof of concept. And um, so looking at the data, it's, it's not really nice to see, but um, we indeed get an advantage of about 25% of the structured back reflector, and we can then apply the simulations. And um, one thing to consider here is that we are again measuring under concentration. So that means that we are not uh, entirely um, in this quadratic regime. We are already approaching the, the, the transition to the linear regime. That means that this focusing effect is not as as dramatic as it would be under one sun. And then there's additional factors that can be uh, optimized. Of course, the packing density of these dimples and also the re reflectivity of the material. Aluminum is not optimal. Um, so if we optimize all these together, um, we end up with this curve. And this would mean that we could expect up to a factor of nine enhancement um, of upconversion yield for an optimized structured back reflector. So that would be a next step to try to realize experimentally. Um, all right, so this would fit in here. So starting from, from these bars, we could go up here. Um, and you again see, although <coughs> it's, it's maybe an, an, a neat concept to try, it will not solve um, these problems alone. So <coughs> we still need to look at the, the sensitizer concentration. Um, so there have been a number of papers in, in recent times, um, particularly many this year um, looking at solid state TTA upconversion materials. I don't want to highlight um, a lot of them. That's a very recent one, which is interesting because these guys have demonstrated that TTA upconversion can also happen within a conjugated polymer. So um, the concept before that for the people looking at polymers was just to blend two, the two organic species into one matrix, a polymer matrix, which didn't work well. And these guys just got rid of the emitter species and, and they have the, uh, the, the polymer itself undergoing the TTA. So this is super yellow. Um, it's a, a, a material used in OLEDs and yeah, can, can just be sourced. And, and they have put a, a porphyrin into this material and found uh, that <laughs> 76 to 99 percent of their triplets are lost by agglomeration um, of the porphyrins within this um, within this material. So yeah, the, the microstructure, one could say, is not yet optimized in this process. So we are also looking at different um, ways of achieving solid state uh, upconversion now that I was told that this is being filmed. I took out a slide on that, not to jeopardize it. 
an under uh, a, a patent application which is underway. But just to show you very briefly some some results that we indeed um, are getting uh, with a solid state up converter. So it indeed works behind a solar cell. Uh, we haven't yet reached um, dramatically high efficiency yields, but that's the very first steps we're taking. And, and I'm personally quite confident that this will be the way um, to improve the up conversion efficiency by, by a large uh, leap. All right, and then if you can, if you can achieve a, hundred, uh, a factor of 100 higher sensitizer concentration, uh, then plasmonics would be an interesting way of, of achieving these uh, local concentrations of light. So as I've been discussing with Supriya a couple of times uh, earlier in this year, and, and unfortunately I found out that at, at the present concentrations that we can realize in the solution, there's no way of expecting a gain with plasmonics because the, the plasmonic resonance and the field enhancement that you see there is just too localized to be <coughs> effectively used by, by the absorption. But once you can, um, you can reach a sub-micron uh, characteristic absorption length of these materials, it's very worthwhile looking at plasmonics, I would guess. And there's also already some modeling works going on uh, which explore the, um, the, the, the best possible designs of plasmonic um, particles in combination with up converters. Um, and the last aspect I would like to cover here is um, that this system is, is also quite versatile because the choice of organic materials allows you to tune the absorption and also emission range. And there's two works I'd like to highlight here. Um, so these guys have extended the, the Pi system of a porphyrin sensitizer as far as they could um, to, sh to redshift the absorption. And indeed, with these materials, you can, you can get a fairly good uh, absorption peak at 800 nanometers. So that's still not, or that's still far away from um, applicability to crystalline silicon, but it's definitely um, yeah, going into the right direction. Um, a second work was showing the combination of two different sensitizers in, in one solution. And you see here that um, you can just broaden your absorption range by having uh, different uh, sensitizer species in the same system. So this versatility may also allow to adapt this upconverting system to different types of solar cells more easily than, for example, other approaches. Um, yes, and with this, I'm uh, already at the end of, of uh, the upconversion part of, of the talk. So I'd like to thank my collaborators. Um, so at Sydney Uni, um, besides myself, we had Dennis Cheng, Burkhard Fickel, Andrew Danos, Rowan McQueen, Tony Curry, and Max Crosley. And of course, um, the head of group, uh, Timothy Schmidt, working on this. Um, HZB, that's uh, where I came from, actually. I did my, my PhD before. We have Klaus Lips leading the project, and Bernd Stanowski, who did the amorphous silicon uh, depositions. Um, the Karlsruhe guys, who uh, contributed the OPV cells. Um, and of course, UNSW, we've had some, some fruitful discussions with Ashraf's group um, here concerning application to OPV, Supriya Pillai. I'd um, like to thank for discussing about the plasmonics and Gavin for hosting me in his uh, third gen meeting over this year and Martin to you for accepting me as a Humboldt fellow, of course. And yeah, funding, of course, from a number of institutions over here and, and for me personally from the Alexander from Humboldt Foundation. And um, now before I conclude, I would like to mention a few uh, little things on my own behalf, um, because it might be interesting for you as well. Um, and this is related to the, <coughs> the next project I'm, I'm moving to, back, back to Berlin. And I've been working on this also before I came here um, as my, my first postdoc uh, position. And this is the Energy Materials in Situ Lab Berlin, which I'd like to br briefly introduce. Um, so many of you uh, are working with si thin film solar cells of some kind. Um, and well, there's, there's a few common questions and issues, I would say, along these different architectures. Um, so in, in many cases, we're interested in the structure and stoichiometry and electronic properties of, of thin films and their interfaces. Um, in many cases, we have multiple deposition steps following each other, uh, where we would like to know what the interfaces um, uh, under, uh, undergoing, which are buried between uh, a growing um, stack of films. Um, so elucidating chemical and electronic structure um, in an in-situ approach uh, would be highly desirable. 
So that would mean having a, um, a state-of-the-art deposition system, which is or preparation facilities, which are compatible to uh, industrial standards and, and cover a wide range of different solar cells. Um, and connecting these to some analytics scheme, which allows to elucidate uh, on these questions here, um, is is a desirable um, thing to have in general in thin film solar cell research. Um, now I'd like to to highlight a, a number of techniques which are based on on synchrotron generated X-ray um, light. So of course you can do photoelectron spectroscopy with this. You can also do uh, X-ray absorption or fluorescent spectroscopy. There's a number of techniques. There's also photoelectron microscopy with a high lateral resolution, and these different uh, techniques are complementary in their, in their probing depth, for example, and also in, in their probing of structural or electronic parameters of, of the system. So what we would dream of is um, to have an, a dedicated X-ray analytics directly connected to um, relevant solar cell processing facilities. And um, so in terms of the X-ray part, you would need for that a very wide range of, of photon energies ranging from the, the deep UV to the hard X-ray. And um, we are going to set up such, uh, such lab in, in a joint effort of uh, the Helmholtz Society and Max Planck Society in Germany. Um, so this will be based in Berlin at the Bessie II storage ring. And that's a third generation uh, storage ring operating at 1.7 GV. So slightly less power than the Australian one, but, but still kind of state of the art, operating since 98. And uh, we are going to build a, a new building or attach a new building to this uh, light source where a, a dedicated beam line covering this energy range from 80 EV to 10 keV will be delivering photons um, to some uh, labs which are entirely dedicated to, to solar energy research. We will have one um, lab which is focusing on, on silicon in situ, in situ spectroscopy, but uh, we will also augment this to cover compound semiconductor and, and novel nanostructured materials. And then the Max Planck Society will reside in this part of the lab, having uh, their own end station working on catalysis for water splitting and uh, a number of associated uh, labs and, and, and preparation facilities. Um, and this is how it's going to look, it's about 600, more than 600 square meters of new lab space. Um, the silicon or, or, or the, the PV um, preparation facilities I'd like to highlight here. Um, so we will have a direct connection to the uh, UHV part whoops, um, of the system, the end station which hosts the different X-ray spectroscopy. Um, units, then we have a, um, a scanning tunneling microscope and, and different uh, UHV based preparation um, chambers here. And these are th essentially three clusters covering the silicon, the compound semiconductor, and the nanomaterials um, preparation. And um, we will try to, to uh, incorporate the, an, a large number of, of state of the art deposition techniques here. And this uh, whole part of the system will be able to work on, on 10 by 10 centimeters. And um, I'm telling you all this because this is going to be a user facility. So the, <coughs> the, the, uh, the, the, the work that, that will be uh, performed there will depend to a large extent on international external users um, booking beam time on, on this facility. It's, it's not yet clear um, to what amount. Um, user beam time will be allocated there, but I would guess it will be between a, a third and maybe 50% of the total beam time. So this is a system which, which will be up um, or will be open to all of you. Um, if you have very uh, specialized or dedicated questions in terms of interface and, and thin film analytics um, and, and the possibility of an in situ approach to look at these. Um, so some, some facts, the whole Funding is about 27 million euros, and the first beam will be hopefully end of 2014 and fully operational by mid-2015. Unfortunately, there's not yet a website to, to look at, but just to stress again, the name of this thing is Emil. So that's a, a pretty, um, pretty German name, actually affiliated also to, to Berlin. That was a very, um, uh, a very uh, important novel um, by Erich Kästner, which is called Emil and 
and the detectives. So we are going to turn this around and make it Emil and the detectors. <laughs> um, yeah, so maybe keep, keep this name in mind and, and stay tuned. There's going to be a website which is already being put together but not online yet. And yeah, hopefully uh, I will see some of, of you guys coming to Berlin at some point to perform research uh, at the Synchrotron. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, apologize for this uh, unwanted advertisement. <laughs> <laughs>